Um, yeah, thanks, thanks to Barbara for that talk. That was really interesting. Um, as someone who's a junior developer on their journey towards being a senior developer myself, found some really useful information out of that. So thanks again. And uh, thanks to the Bristec guys for, for hosting. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Warren Bolt. I am a, uh, I'm a software engineer with Candide. Um, kind of my academic background's a bit in a bit more traditional software engineering and then also machine learning side of things. And that kind of comes together for my interest in the machine learning ops side of things. And that is why for the topic of my talk tonight, it's Kubernetes native machine learning pipelines with Argo and Selby. In terms of structure, um, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, what our company Candy does. Then I'll uh, frame the problem a bit by talking about machine learning pipelines, why they can be difficult, some desirable characteristics of them that we'd like. And then I'll talk about Kubernetes, Argo and Selby and that's and why they're good tools for, for building out your machine learning pipelines and deploying your machine learning pipelines in production. And then finally, I'll attempt to give a bit of a demo of, of some of these tools in action. So yeah, um, I, I work at Candide, a uh, full stack engineer, a little bit of machine learning, a little bit of, of the front end, a little bit of back end. We have quite a broad stack. So it's a very exciting company. We're, um, we're a social networking app, a marketplace and knowledge base for all things gardening. Um, we have we have journalists producing great news content yeah, and a real encyclopedia of plants, insects, and um, catalog of places to visit. In terms of machine learning, uh, we're currently building out our machine learning capabilities. So we're, um, we currently have a plant ID model in the app, which uh, classifies the species of plants and genus of plants from a, from a photo. Um, but we have a lot more coming in 2020, including a question answering bot and um, recommender systems across the app to start personalizing the content to our users. So yeah, it's a really exciting time. And as a machine learning enthusiast, I'm quite excited to, to be uh, involved in a lot of these projects. Yeah, let's um, talk about machine learning pipelines. So first of all, what exactly do I mean by a machine learning pipeline? Well, the way I see it, uh, there are two phases to the machine learning, the machine learning project overall. There's sort of the, uh, the initial experimentation and prototyping phase where you're trying a lot of different things, working out what's a good approach to, to building a model that's going to perform well at the task at hand. So taking that data, playing around with it, trying to generate good predictions, but in a sort of more informal manner. And then there's the whole second phase, which in a lot of senses is almost the more important phase, which is formalizing that approach you've taken to actually take your model into production so you can start using it, say in your app or wherever else. There's no point, uh, there's no point uh, building out this, this really accurate, this 99.9% .9 accurate model in the experiment in experimentation phase if you're never actually going to get into production. So I'm talking more about this second phase in this talk of actually building out your machine learning pipeline to, to take it to production. So within that, there's usually a, a fairly typical set of tasks that needs to be run in sequence, take you from that starting point, which is your, your ingestion of your data from where the source that may be, right through to your endpoint, which is hopefully the deployment of the model somewhere so you can start calling out to it, getting predictions in a production environment. Within that, of course, there's these, there's these other steps already defined in this diagram of, of uh, kind of preparing your data, engineering features, and then obviously training your model. And what's important to know about these, these pipelines is that they're not going to be a one-off thing where you just run it once and you get your model and then you forget about it. We're, we're likely going to need to, to be able to, to iterate on this pipeline, to experiment, to improve it for, for many reasons. So we may need to add more data to the pipeline and then rerun, and retrain and deploy a new model. We might want to add more steps. We might want to make improvements to the model. So with that in mind, um, we want to be able to obviously run these, these pipelines in an automated, scalable and reproducible manner so we can actually go in and easily easily iterate on these pipelines to deploy a new model 
for whatever reason that may be. So just to just to go into a little bit more detail on that, there's, there's a few desirable characteristics, I'd say, that we'd want from our pipeline to, to actually achieve these ends of automation, scalability, reproducibility. Now, this is, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's just some of the, the common things that I think can, can often cause difficulties without a good tool for, for building out your pipelines. So firstly, management of dependencies and languages. So over the course of building out this workflow, um, you'll, you'll need to install all sorts of different libraries and packages for the various steps of this pipeline. And these, these libraries and packages are likely gonna be different for, for individual steps. You may have different versions needed for, for one upstream step of the pipeline. Meanwhile, one of the downstream steps of the pipeline needs a completely different version of that same package. Um, and on top of that, you might also want to be able to support different languages within this pipeline. So given, depending on the complexity of, of your, your workflow, you may have an upstream step that's, uh, that's built by your, your data engineers of doing some of the like heavy data lifting, and they want to build that in Python. Meanwhile, your data scientists themselves actually wanted to, to build their model in R. So we've got that model training step that's been developed in R. And we really would want a way to, to kind of plug these pieces together without, without too much extra work and without it being a completely manual process, just all in the interest of kind of improving the, the, the iteration time and automating as much as possible. Uh, provisioning of compute resources. So obviously these days, like it's just, it's just a given that especially in the in deep learning that you're gonna you're gonna want to, to leverage all those those GPUs from the various cloud providers, say AWS GCP. You want to make it easy to be able to, to leverage those those that extra compute resource for both the uh, the pipeline steps and for that final model deployment. And again we want to be able to do this without being a complete manual process. I know in uh, previous machine learning projects I've had to do I had to like go in and, and copy a load of files into a virtual machine and then manually run a training book job and then copy all the data out again. It just makes it a really slow manual process that's less scalable and just slows your time to iterating. Monitoring, this is hugely important and kind of one of the aspects of, of the machine learning uh, DevOps kind of merger that's, that's getting more attention these days. So. First of all, being able to just monitor the progress of your workflows is really important. Obviously, things are going to go wrong when, when uh, running these workflows, and you want to be able to easily find out what has gone wrong and, and diagnose that issue. And also, when it comes to the deployment side of things, it's, it's really useful to be able to, to monitor your performance of your model quite easily and customize that for your own needs, whatever project you're, you're developing. And uh, scalability, of course. So both in building out, developing your, your pipeline, you want to be able to easily scale out the amount of data it can handle. Then also again, on when it comes to deploying your model and serving requests, you want to be able to easily scale out the amount of requests that can handle and make it resilient to, to getting too much demand. So like I said, this, this isn't a, an exhaustive list of the things we'd want from our machine learning pipelines, but it's kind of just a, an overview of some of the, the very important aspects that we're after from a tool when building up these pipelines. So this is where Kubernetes and uh, Argo and Seldon come into play. So, um, so Kubernetes itself is sort of like the, the underlying tool for, for um, building out your uh, containerized applications in the cloud in the sense that you, um, you Build, you simply build your app into a, a, a container, say that a, a Docker container, for example, which I'm sure many of you have uh, used before. Um, and then Kubernetes essentially handles all of the, uh, the orchestration, the, uh, the provisioning of all of these containers and ensures that they are, that you give it, so you give Kubernetes a desired state of the application and Kubernetes will go away and ensure that, that your application stays in that state. And it um, follows the structure of code paradigm. So it means that your, your, the, the infrastructure of this, this cluster, this Kubernetes cluster you've built is there in the code, meaning it's reproducible. 
And it's also highly declarative, meaning that you essentially, you ask it for the resources that you want and the, the desired state of your application and Kubernetes will go away and just ensure that it keeps running in that state. So it really takes away a lot of the pain of, of uh, actually developing the infrastructure of the underlying infrastructure of, of your applications. And this makes a good tool for, for doing data science machine learning because it kind of achieves a lot of a lot of what I've just mentioned previously of having highly scalable, reproducible of your lips. Um, it abstracts or it abstracts away a lot of the, uh, the the hidden complexities from the data scientists, from your data engineers, allowing them to get on with doing the things that they want to do, building the models, improving those models, and monitoring those models. So then when it comes to um, actually the tools you use to, to run your pipelines and deploy the models themselves, this is where Argo and Selden come into play. So they're both essentially just component Kubernetes cluster. And this means that they are they're viewed as native Kubernetes component in your pipelines and uh, that niceness I just mentioned, the scalability of the, the monitoring, the, uh, the declarative specification saying, I want this many resources, go away and handle that for me. So Argo itself is sort of the tool to um to orchestrate the, the sequence of, uh, to orchestrate the tasks to run in sequence. So it handles the, yeah, ensuring like tasks get run one after the other and passing data around between those tasks. Whereas Selden is um, a tool to, to actually deploy your models on a Kubernetes cluster at the end of it all. So that allows you to, um, yeah, it essentially allows, gives you like a, a served model that you can go out and make requests to and again, abstracts away a lot of the, the complexity of, of spinning that up manually. So, what's nice about what's nice about building out these uh, these pipelines on on Kubernetes is that each of the tasks in that pipeline just need to be in a uh, a containerized image, meaning that you can you can uh, use any language you want for the individual tasks, and um, obviously all the dependencies for those tasks are completely isolated to that individual task. So that achieves a couple of the, uh, the, the desirable characteristics I mentioned previously. So in terms of the features, Argo offers all sorts of, um, of complex ways to define your workflows. So you can either define more simple workflows, which will just be a, a, essentially a sequence of steps, step A, task A, followed by task B, etc. Or you can define more complex ones as a, a directed acyclic graph is what you can see in this image here. So this allows you to do more complex branching of, of your tasks and combining. You can, um, there's also more complex uh, workflow definition capabilities. So you can, um, you can dynamically generate tasks to run in parallel based on, um, based on some list of parameters. So you can imagine, for example, using this to, um, to kind of train several variants of the model all at once and then combine them together again in the latest step. Um, also offers conditional, conditionally starting tasks, so only triggering certain tasks uh, based on the output of a previous task. So again, for example, you could have potentially have it that your training step will only trigger the, the final deploy step if, if the, uh, the accuracy of the model is above a certain threshold. It's really nice customizable workflow capabilities also has um, artifact management, and this integrates with, with GCS, uh, Google Cloud Storage, and AWS S3 object stores. So this allows you to, um, to easily save the metadata for tasks and easily share the metadata between tasks. So you can go, it just makes it a real doddle to, to kind of save your model in that, that training step and then pass that through to the, uh, the, the final deploy step. And all of these are stored in your, your preferred S3 object storage in the cloud as well, so you have a record of that. Um, and to manage these workflows and to monitor them, it has a nice UI, which is uh, what you can see in this image. And it also has a CLI, where you actually do the, the management and the submitting of your workflows. And you, can, um, you can also define your workflows and view and download the artifacts within the UI. 
And then just a couple more nice little features that it has. You can, um, so we define our, our workflow specifications in, in YAML, as is the norm generally in, um, in Kubernetes land. And um, you can, within that, rather than like having a separate Docker container that you build for each task, you can, uh, you can write inline scripts within your, within your uh, workflows. So if you've got a fairly simple task that is just like a few, a few bash commands, you can write that within your workflow, which just cuts down a little bit of extra work. And also cron workflows for having it trigger uh, based on a certain schedule is quite nice. Um, and then Seldon, as I mentioned before, is, is the tool used for actually deploying your model. So this allows us to, uh, to deploy our models to, to Kubernetes in a very uh, a really scalable manner, allowing us to specify like how many replicas of this model we want, just to make it easy to handle all those of that, that potentially increased demand of the uh, requests coming into the model. And it's, uh, it's resilient to faults, obviously, because of that, because Kubernetes always maintains that desired state. So this makes it a really nice tool for, for deploying and serving your models and not having to worry about whether it's just going to fall over all of a sudden. Um, on top of that, you can um, some more uh, that it has a complex inference graph itself, meaning you can um, so you can define A/B tests where it'll randomly uh, randomly route the uh, the request to to one of two models. Um, you can also do uh, multi-arm bandits, which kind of uh, allow you to to over time to use, make use of the best performing model based on some reward signal. Um, also has the ability to combine the outputs of different models within that inference graph and uh, input and output transformers, so allowing you to do some kind of like pre-processing, some, some post-processing of your model all within that, that seldom deployment. Then um, there's also outlier detection and model explainers that you can tack onto the end, which will allow you to, again, just like extra customization, better monitoring of your models. So allowing you to see if there's any outliers in the requests that are coming in and also offering explanations of why this model made that prediction. These are stuff that you can add to your, to your model deployment really easily with Seldon. It's just something I really like. Um, and then also Seldon is essentially like as customizable as you want, so we can um, we can add whatever metrics we want to track, make it easy to uh, say keep track of the other uh, classes that are being predicted. Um, just things like that you can really kind of make make what you want with it. So just to just to caveat these these are uh, these benefits of Selden and Argo, I would say that they're not for everyone. And they're they lack some of the more like machine learning specific uh, features of some of the other tools, for example, Kubeflow, of like giving you an inbuilt idea of like experiments and some of the more machine learning specific tools that you'd expect. But the, the counterpoint to that is that they give you a lot more customization. You can really kind of make what you want of these tools and combine them in different ways that other, other tools won't, other tools and frameworks like Kubeflow won't give you, it kind of, as it's less opinionated about the way of doing things, you can really kind of yeah, just define your own way of doing things while still gaining all that power of, of the Kubernetes cluster and using that to your advantage. So um, yeah, without further ado, I'll attempt to give a little bit of a demo. Um, my internet speed has been awful here, so I'm, at, I'm not actually going to do a live demo of a pipeline running, but I've got, a, I've got an example workflow, an Argo workflow that I, I've used in the past, and then I've got a, um, an already running Seldon deployment that I can make a request to, just to, to give you a little flavor of how things look. So here, hopefully you should be able to see an um, uh, example Argo workflow. So this is my, my workflow YAML file. Um, you can see here I've got, this is a, a DAG workflow that I'm defining. So we've got several several tasks, train, uh, preparing data, pre-processing, and, and training the model. And then down at the bottom, we actually have uh, where, we, where we define these tasks themselves, where we say, 
is the image that this task is going to be using. And we can um, specify input parameters. We can specify um, any artifacts that are being input and then any artifacts that's going to output. And this is connected up to, um, to Google Cloud Storage bucket. So all the, all the uh, inputs and outputs for each of these steps will be saved to that Google Cloud Storage bucket. Um, so yeah, that's, that's essentially the workflow. Um, then we've got the Argo CLI tool here. So we can do an Argo list and look at some of the previous workflows that I've run. We can do a, an Argo get on one of these workflows and kind of introspect the, uh, the steps that have run in that workflow. So we can see this, this workflow ran successfully. It, um, it ran each of the steps. And this is also, as you'll be able to see better in the, uh, the UI in a sec, this is also um, done two sets of tasks to run in parallel. So one for an English data set and one for a Spanish data set. So this, this example, machine learning pipeline. And then if we jump over into UI, so this is essentially yeah, my list of, of pipelines that I've run again, and we can um, we can jump in and and maybe not, maybe it's not working. Just give that a refresh. Cool. Yeah, so now you can see we've got a a, a pipeline with with two sets of tasks running in parallel. This is um, why I touched on earlier of, of dynamically generating sets of tasks to run in parallel, which is really cool. So we're training two, two variants of the model. We can click through to an individual task. We can go in and view the logs. <laughs> it's not actually working now properly, but we can go and view the logs. Uh, we, can, we can go in and see, view the artifacts for that individual task. You can download the artifacts there. So it's just a, a nice way of kind of monitoring your workflows. And uh, we also have this, this uh, sort of Gantt chart view, which shows you how long uh, individual tasks in the workflow took, which is really nice. Um, and then I'll just show you quickly an example of a seldom deployment I've got running. So if I get my running cell deployment. Got one. Got one there. I can show you a little bit what that looks like. So this is just an example of cell deployment of of basically SK learn iris classification problem. And we can, um, so I've got I'm port forwarding that at the moment, so we can go and make an example request to that. So I'm just giving it some a JSON payload of the uh, of one sample and some feature names, and we can get back get back our response, which is the, uh, the probabilities of each of the, the three classes. So you can, you can easily plug these seldom deployments into your, your Kubernetes cluster and talk to them easily with, from your other services in your Kubernetes cluster. Um, and that is about all I've got, actually. It was slightly quicker than I anticipated in the end. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm free to, to take any questions now. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that one. I'm going to, uh, I, I'm going to unmute everybody. And so unfortunately can, I still can't hear the you. NHS <laughs> that, but, ah, okay. Uh, Mick, can anyone else hear me? Yeah, um, can we, yeah. yeah. Okay. Can we just show, show a, uh, our appreciation for, for Warren? So maybe we'll let Chris, uh, Chris, you do the questions uh, because Warren can't hear me. <laughs> that wouldn't work, would it? Okay. Um, uh, 
Sorry, I've just muted. Uh, Chris, I've just muted you again because you were muted when I muted everybody. That's fine. I think I just unmuted cool. myself. Um, well done. <laughs> so yeah, we've got um, we've got one from Chris and one from Nick, which obviously no one's interested in. Um, so um, uh, the, the other question is: I think the promise of automation and pipelines is clear, um, but how do they go wrong? What commonly breaks with Argo and Sheldon? What do you reckon, Warren? Just bringing the questions up on the screen. There we go. Thank you very much. So yeah, um, obviously that's that's the only question that hasn't come from cool. moderators. If I, you like, Warren. Yes, I, I can't actually get anybody, which is not ideal. But um, I can um, I can take that that top question first. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think one of the uh, the things I found with with the uh, Argo and Selden is that in in simpler cases and when you have quite a, a fresh Kubernetes cluster with not a lot of stuff on it, it can be fairly simple to get these up and running. But if if you have a slightly more complex uh, project and if you have a slightly more uh, kind of already fully fledged Kubernetes cluster with a lot of stuff on it. There's quite a lot of uh, configuration you might need to do to get working, a lot of, um, a lot of kind of adding adding uh, specific volumes, a lot of uh, managing the, uh, the underlying workflow controllers and the, the, the Selden deployment controller, and things can often just go wrong there, and it's hard, it's hard at first to kind of work out what exactly has gone wrong. So I've um, I've had I've been in contact with uh, people from the Argo on Argo and Selden Slack channels, just trying to work out some problems there. So I'd say definitely like the initial the initial setup stage can be a bit a bit of a, a nightmare at times. But then once once you've overcome that initial stage, I think it is it's quite a lot nicer and not too bad after that. It has mainly been the the initial setups that I've, I've struggled with most. And it, um, I think that may that may vary from person to person as well. As I've already had a bit of experience with Kubernetes, I'm probably a bit more ready to 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 go with with these tools than, than people who are coming from purely machine learning background would. Um, the the top question currently, I suppose I've sort of answered it, but I'd say. Overall, the, the the learning curve in terms of like concepts you have to learn is quite quite low, especially compared to other tools. So I've had a little play around with with Kubeflow, and there's kind of a lot of, of a lot of new concepts you need to learn, and it's quite opinionated about the way you have to build out your pipelines, and it also requires you to do that all within within Python. I just think this. This uh, by by kind of stripping away a lot of the added extras in these tools, it kind of it makes it easier to understand. So Argo is essentially just like all of these every step by line are contains it doesn't matter what they're doing underneath, just you know, wrap it in a Docker image and then you can plug that into your pipeline, which I think is really nice. And again with with Selden, it, all you essentially need is a uh, a Python a wrapper class around around your model, and that model could essentially be doing whatever you want. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a model. All Selden is doing essentially like wrapping wrapping your code in a Flask server and giving you some some extra helpers in terms of like the the controller manager on Kubernetes and stuff like that. So I think that's probably one of the, the best the biggest benefits of these tools for me is that the, the like conceptual learning curve is quite is quite small. <clears throat> Does that answer the question about um, um, packaging up? I'll take time? I'll take Matt's question next. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take Matt's question next, and then you know, Chris is after. Um, so I, I touched on it a second ago. Packaging up the, the machine learning tasks—it's Selden's quite unopinionated about how it does that. Essentially, 
you just need to. So for the main for the main uh, machine learning frameworks, your SK learns, your TensorFlows, and that they allow you to essentially once you've saved that model as uh, say an SK learn, you're just saving an inbuilt SK learn class as a pickle file. You can uh, you can use that directly in your um, in your Selden deployment. Same for the TensorFlow. But um, if you have a kind of quite custom machine learning model you want you want to deploy, all you need to do is essentially have this kind of boilerplate class, Python class that defines like an initialization method and the predict method. Within that, all you like you can do whatever you want. Just like load up your your models and then just ensure that your the predict method. So it's really open to to like whatever you want to do with it. Essentially, um, experience of TPUs as opposed to GPUs, I've, I haven't had to use them at all, um, so I can't really speak to that question too much. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually know. Maybe somebody else is slightly more informed in this on whether you can um, you can add TPUs to your your Kubernetes cluster. Um, feel free, someone in the chat, to to enlighten us on that front. But um, yeah, in terms of adding the GPUs to your to your pipelines on Kubernetes, that's that's quite straightforward. And once you've um, once you've sort of added that to the underlying cluster, it's just a case of like adding, specifying what how much GPU resource you want, which is nice. Um, cool. Yeah, I mean, um, I th we're kind of nearing yeah, the end. Yeah, uh, well, that's the that you can, yeah, they, they have TPUs on, on Google Compute Engine. So theoretically, I assume you could you can add it in a similar way to, that you can to GPUs. Not 100% not sure on that. I can't quite see Bruce Gooter's message. Question. Chris, can, can uh, you read out uh, Bruce? I'm planning on testing Bruce, outcomes. Bruce, Bruce Goose is saying meets the goals you want. How are you planning on testing the outcomes? So your implementation there, there could probably be a whole other talk on the actual the testing of the outcomes and, and what tools you might use for that. But um, I think that's yeah, I think that's a very good question. Like it's quite open to debate that area at the moment. So one one thing we're doing internally is um, essentially keeping track of the uh, the classes that get predicted on our deployed model, and then we can um. We can uh, export the metrics on that and uh, view it in um, view it in a dashboard in a Grafana dashboard, so we can we can kind of keep track of of the like, distribution of predictions, and then from there we could probably do something like if that distribution of predictions is is drifting massively from the the, the training set, then you can start thinking, oh, maybe something's wrong there. Yeah. Um, that's that's something that I, I need to learn more about at the moment actually so yeah again if, if anybody has any uh, any useful tools on that front please please enlighten us in the chat okay, so being exchanged between argo steps it doesn't have to be cloud storage you can um you can actually you can install minio to your kubernetes cluster and use that as a kind of uh, a store as uh, S3 object storage hosted wherever he's close you know, the, the cloud providers and that'll, you can uh, yeah exchange data between steps like that or if you don't really want to deal with any kind of object store you can do it uh, in a slightly more manual way of, of um, kind of mounting volumes to your to your individual steps in the, uh, the workflow and then sharing those volumes between the steps which means you lose the ability to go in and um, view the artifacts in, in the UI and download them, but it will allow you to still effectively pass the data between those, those uh, steps of your workflow. That, that's brilliant. Um, th there's only one question. Um, can you play these tool Can you play with these tools without the cloud? Or did you answer that one? Cool. Well, unless anybody else has any questions. I think I'm, I'm done. Great. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Warren, and thank you, Barbara, for tonight.
Um, so next month, uh, we've got uh, Joan Garcia on um, software-defined networks and Francesca Renzi on Tales of Docker. Uh, but the format might change uh, depending on kind of uh, internal conversations. Also, um, obviously, we'll, I'll show you the results of the poll in a second, which I think were quite clear. Um, so just to put on your radar, the, um, the Bristol ML Ops Day that was meant to be in April uh, was actually being postponed until September due to the, obviously, the uh, coronavirus. Um, so we're still hoping it's going to go ahead in September. Uh, do check out the website. And in the meantime, um, we partnered with Dot Science uh, and there's an MLOps community uh, in which we're having online uh, events every Wednesday. So do check out uh, MLOps.community if that's uh, of, of interest. Um, and if you've enjoyed uh, the talks, please do uh, spread the word. That would be uh, be amazing. Thank you to to uh, get get the word out there that um, Bristol is still kicking and kicking online. Um, and thanks to our sponsors, uh, Ogo Energy.